again, we are moving toward practical interpretation uh, from this subject of biblical interpretation, and we're heading toward our final week, and I always want it to be more practical. So every time we begin, uh, I try to make um, my um, lecture is a little bit more practical, and I want to I wanna make it so that um, what we learned today, and perhaps this course, that it won't be just another um, lecture, that I want it to be practical, I want um, I want one foot in, in pra practice and, and correct practice of what we learn and another in the um, so I, I, I want equal orthodoxy in our practice and uh, we've come in a way that um, we, we talked about biblical interpretation how hermeneutics has this idea to go from uh, the art and science of biblical interpretation to exegesis, the, the correct way to read the uh, Old and New Testament. We surveyed the, all the books of the Old Testament, gave uh, a, a quick, pretty quick and um, fast review on, on the survey of the Old Testament. And every book was uh, outlined with the textbook, um, with probably, I think, Walton's test textbook. And I, I surveyed the Old Testament in a way that, that we can gather practical insights on how to interpret the Old Testament. The Old Testament, again, Jesus, what Jesus was ministering in, Galilee and also in Judea. The only scripture that was written was the Old Testament. The Old Testament was the scripture of, of the time. So uh, understanding that this was the scriptures that the disciples saw, this was the scripture that the apostles saw, this was the scripture that the uh, our, our religious forefathers, our forefathers in our own religion, look back to and said, okay, this is, this is according to the scriptures. Uh, it is written. When Jesus said, when he was tempted by Satan three times in the wilderness, when he said, it is written, he quoted, he quoted the Old Testament. Uh, it is written uh, as if all these things are written for me and for, for my sake. Uh, so all these Old Testament promises, they point to a single story, the story of the Messiah. And they point to Jesus in a way that Abraham, let's see the characters, that Abraham was a picture, a shadow of what was to come. Jesus is the greater Abraham, right? Jesus left his father's uh, house, left, left his father's homeland, just like Jesus left the homeland which is heaven, just like Jesus left his father's house and father's home um, and, and, and traveled and entrusted his, uh, God's guidance and promise. And Abraham's covenant, uh, he became a blessing. Abraham became a blessing and that blessing was Jesus Christ. And we know Jacob, uh, uh, through, through Isaac, through Jacob, uh, uh, with Isaac, Isaac uh, by faith laid on uh, he took on the wood, right? As they were going to Mount, Mount Moriah for the sacrifice, for the test that Abraham was uh, uh, was going to pass. And he took uh, the, the, the two servants. The, the, the story is uncanny. And, and they're going up to Mount Moriah. God already said sacrifice Isaac. And uh, what, what's amazing is that there's two servants. There's two servants going up on a donkey, uh, with with uh, with wood, what happens is uh, the father Abraham and Isaac Isaac just carries on the wood and is stand by them so the servants cannot follow. And and and, and apparent, uh, amazingly, there are on Golgotha. There's two other people bearing the cross, right? But the only uh, 
uh, the, old, the son, the son, which is Isaac. Isaac bears, takes that wood and, and he willingly obeys uh, the, the, the sacrifice, the, the order the, from God to sacrifice, by right? commandment of God to sacrifice himself. Isaac does that. And, and Jesus is the greater Isaac. He is the son. And the portrayal of the father and the son. And the father takes the knife, right? About to kill Isaac. And angel, angel stops him. And what happens, as we know, the father does strike the son when Jesus is on the cross and he dies. And the father pours out his wrath on his own son. And, and, and because of that, we have a life because God's justice, God's wrath, God's mercy has been satisfied through Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus is the greater Moses. Moses gave the covenant uh, taught on the mountain. Jesus, just like that, saved the Jesus people um, from Egypt, which is, uh, it was the foreign power that, that had a nation that had uh, um, riches and influence over Israel. And at that, at that time, Israel were slaves under Pharaoh. And in the same way, Israel uh, was slaves at, that, that, at the time of Jesus. And the Israelites were subjugated under the Roman Empire. Uh, and they could not even uh, request uh, power. They had to go to Pilate to kill someone. That's that's uh that's the, well, that was the extent of their independence and power, and Jesus was the greater Moses, saving his people. Also, Moses instituted God's law um, on the mountain. Jesus taught the law, God's law on on God's uh, teachings and in, in mount, on mountains. Jesus is the greater King David, David King. Who is going? He's going to be the messianic king who's going to rule forever and ever. And we can see that all these Old Testament characters and survey through the survey, we can know that uh, all these things were written for Jesus Christ. And knowing that we have moved on to the New Testament, and every book we covered, every book. Um, covered every book um, in the New Testament and in the same way we uh, learn how to serve and interpret the uh, New Testament. Um, we talked about more, a little bit more about hermeneutics and interpretation. Uh, we talked a lot about doctrine um, on the Mark Driscoll's book. And then we're um, talking about Christian faith and hopefully next week after we Finish Christian faith. Uh, my my desire is to tackle some practical Bible study methods, and applying our um, what we have gained in our study uh, Bible interpretive tools in order to um, find uh, a timeless truth, uh, a message that. Uh, is, is timeless for us to know. So we want to get this message uh, out there. Um, um, we want to understand through this lecture, through what we have learned, uh, we want to uh, gain some kind of uh, lens or tool that we can gain so that uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not feeding you just lectures and, and textbook, but I am actually giving you some set of tools that when you read the Bible, you can understand with um, truth, with, uh, with a universal, uh, with, with a perspective, um, and uh, I believe that um, with these books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, um, all these Pentateuch and Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, 
Kings, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, um, Job, Psalm, Prophets, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, um, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, uh, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Book of Zechariah, Malachi, all these prophets, law, psalms, proverbs, wisdom literature, and the prophets, law and the prophets, um, and Ketuvim, um, all these books are communicative of the serving. Uh, just as New Testament as well, creator wise, only God holy, transcendent righteous, just compassion, gracious, covenant making God. It's about God. All these scriptures point toward God. Also, loyal redeemer. God is loyal, God is redeemer, God is judge and savior, law and grace. Central theme is Christ, Messiah. Everything was written with Messiah at the center. Social action, eschatological hope is uh, shown in this uh, book. So remember we talked about Matthew. Mark, Luke, and John, these four Gospels, and Acts, which um, basically um, connects the Gospel narrative to, um, and then provides context in, uh, in that they were supposed to be read with Luke and Acts together, um, because it was written by the same author, Luke, um, and it connects directly to the epistles of Paul. Pauline is based on so Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, Peter, John, uh, John 1 through 3, um, so 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and uh, letters of Jude, Revelation, and again, hermeneutics. Um, that's what we hold as scripture now. We have both the Old Old Testament and the New Testament together. And the, 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 there were some hermeneutical principles, basic Bible interpretation, normal interpretation, single meaning interpretation before application, moral, more moralistic hermeneutic, where we try to find morals for every kind of teaching. So that in itself is another kind of hermeneutic. We discuss that allegorical interpretation, um, and uh, again, analogy of scripture. Um, and we briefly started grasping some systematic theology. Um, and I, I try to mention that a little bit um, last week. Anthropology, creation, Christology, pneumatology, soteriology, ecclesiology. Eschatology. Um, last week, a couple of weeks about doctrine, uh, about the Trinity, creation, God, God's image in Mother Day, um, the fall, Genesis three, covenant, covenant. God is a God is a covenant God, incarnation. Um, God comes, God dies. Um, so this is the basic tenets of Christian doctrine, resurrection, church, worship, stewardship, revelation of God. Systematic theology, this is where we're at right now, knowing God, God living in us, God who lives. This is where we are. And in, in, in the names and attributes of God, uh, we have seen that we have seen that um, we have seen that, that there are two kinds of attributes for God. So first, God, there is a incommunicable attributes, the attributes that God has alone. Um, in Christian Orthodoxy, um, they have always uh, held this to be God's incommunicable attributes cannot be shared. That focusing on God's character and His works 
throughout the unfolding of Scripture, a uh, good place to begin is the names of God, because in God's names, uh, God's essence is hidden and incomprehensible. Calvin observes this. His name just means his character, so far as he's been pleased to make known to us. So various are cognates of the generic L, which is holy, lordly, and mighty one. It was wide circulation already before the covenant at Sinai. So uh, L was used for uh, describing God even uh, more than just the covenant God. So El Shaddai, uh, Shahad, Shaddad means powerful, which identify with the acts in history. Adonai meant Lord, Judge, Ruler. Was it was also a common title, and there are names and the name, and it's only Israel that God has given the personal name Yahweh to, uh, for Him to call I am who I am. Remember Moses uh, asked in Genesis, uh, not Genesis, Exodus three. Um, God meets him. God meets Moses in the wilderness in the burning bush, and uh, the bush was being burning. The, the shrub in the wilderness was burning with fire, but it was not being consumed. So Moses, knowing that this is a divine, this is something miraculous that's happening, he draws near. He draws near to him. Doesn't walk away. He draws near to God. And what happens is the mystery is that when we do new, draw near to God, He draws near to us. He does say, take up your shoes, take up your sandal, make yourself holy, uh, purify yourself some, in some way. And yet God does, with His mercy, excuse me, draws us near to Him. So uh, in that, Moses uh, is given the command to let, uh, go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And, and, and what happens is that God what he says is that you, uh, you will be like, um, yeah, you'll be my hand of judgment on Pharaoh, Pharaoh's house. And Moses says, oh, I can't do it. You know, I'm not very good at speaking. Uh, that's why Moses is, uh, and, and God says, you'll have Aaron, your brother. He's going to be like a prophet to you uh, and you're going to be God, like God to Pharaoh. Uh, you're going to be my, my vessel. And Moses still, still says, no, like what happens? What happens if, my, if the people, the very people that you're trying to rescue says, okay, then who did you meet in the wilderness? Who did you meet in the burning bush? Who gave you the command? What kind, what is the name of the God that gave you the command? Um, and God says, it's the God of your forefathers. And he says, I am who I am. Gives him the personal name of God, Yahweh. So this appears in our English translation in small capitals, L-O-R-D, to distinguish from the title Adonai Lord. So whenever in revival there is the Tetragrammaton, we, we read it as Adonai or Lord. Uh, on one hand, the revolution of God's name is a sign of transcendence, meaning measuring the gulf between majesty, God's majesty and human servant. Misusing God's name required the death penalty under the Old Covenant, Exodus 20 and Leviticus, Leviticus 24. So we cannot utter the name of God, misuse and use the Lord's name in vain. Nevertheless, his name is also a sign of God's imminence, having been given to his people as a pledge of his personal presence to be invoked in danger and praised at all times. The event in which God reveals his personal name to Moses bears striking features of it's covenantal context. Pharaoh is Lord of Egypt, even an object of worship. At the time of Yahweh's children are under the heavy hand of oppression, God gives Moses a personal name to invoke. Uh, even, even as the Israelites are suffering and Moses is doing his own thing in the wilderness, God gives uh, him, God gives him, God gives his children a personal name of God. Each plague that God sends upon Egypt represents the defeat of one of the principal deities of Egypt and the Egyptian pantheon. Israel's God, Yahweh, is Lord of all. God is Lord. So every plague in the Old Testament shows that Yahweh is the Lord. Yahweh is the only God, is Lord of all. In sharp contrast with names of pagan deities, therefore, God's name is not a secret password for manipulating cosmic forces just like Egyptian gods were, Ra, Aset, and things like that. 
Rather, it is a personal covenantal guarantee. So God's name was not supposed to be used in vain because it was being used in vain by other nations around the world, such as Egypt, who used God's name in vain in order to get what they want to control the, their circumstances. But God, God's covenant name was not a secret password, but it was a personal covenant of guarantee. guarantee. On the basis of this liberation, Israel, Israel, is not only, uh, is, Israel is not to invoke any gods or other lords. I am the Lord, Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, into the house, out of the house of slavery, into the house of God. You, you shall have no other gods before me. That's what that is all about. The infinite sovereign God over all condescends to identify himself as the God of Israel, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The point is frequently made, uh, the point is frequently made that the Lord, Adonai, is our Lord, Yahweh, and vice versa. The New Testament also shows a corresponding tendency to keep up with the unfolding plot of the New Testament. Um, if we see the Hebrew use of El, the New Testament writers had no trouble using the generic Greek word Theos, God, already employed in the Greek transition of the Old Testament, known as the Septuagint. So God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Sinai, the God of Zion, the God of Israel, the God of Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, our great God, only Savior, and so forth. Thus, God, who is not intrinsically bound by any creaturely limit, uh, nevertheless binds himself freely to us in our times and place. So, this idea of name of God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, uh, to God be the glory forever and ever. In John 4, God is unavailable to human investigation apart from his own initiative and meditation or mediation. Further, again, express doxologically, this God is not identified as the blessed and only sovereign King of Kings, Lord of Lord, Lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in an un unapproachable light, whom no one has seen, ever seen, or can see. To him be honor, eternal glory, dominion. Amen. First Timothy 6, 15 and 16. Only such attitude of prayer, praise, and reserve humility can we approach God's self-revelation. So God's incommunicable attributes as follows. Uh, so simplicity, attribute of God's simplicity, and infinite, as infinite spirit, God is not made up of different parts. His attributes are identical with his being. So uh, aseity, which is self-existence, immutability, immutability, God is unchanging, there is no shadow of change with being, unchangeableness and impassibility, Incapac in, uh, incapacity, in incapacity for being overwhelmed by suffering, e eternity, eternality, uh, God's transcendence of time, God is outside of time, God is, uh, God does not, he, uh, he's not influenced by time. As we will see in these attributes, although we have negation that most frequently challenges the supposedly latter corruption of biblical theology by pagan metaphysics. However, it is not only later theologians, but the Apostle Paul as well, who uses the Alpha primitive prefix referring to God, for example, immortal and invisible. The 7th century Genevan uh, theologian Francis Turretin pointed, pointed out that this uh, Socinians re reproach the traditional doctrine of God on the basis that the whole doctrine is metaphysical rather than biblical. Specifically, they charge that God's simplicity, aseity, uh, immutability, and exhaustive foreknowledge ordained in stored philosophy of claim that has been repeated consistently down to our own day in the same vein. So, most recently, these criticisms have been repeated under the guise of a postmodern rebellion under onto theology, literally being theology or theology of being. Although contemporary critics often rep represent their accounts as postmodern, both the divine attributes that they reject, their arguments are often indistinguishable from those found in the work of the 19th century German liberalism and the Hegelian mediating school. So, so we're going to talk about these each of these attributes, simplicity, unity of God. So, as human beings, we are complex and compound creatures. That is, we are made up of various parts. However, God is simple and spiritual. God is spirit. On the other hand, that means God is not the sum total of his attributes, but simultaneously everything 
that all of the attributes reveal. So that means he is spirit, and yet he's not. Uh, he's not. He's just not the sum total of all the attributes. But that does not mean attributes reveal a part of him. On the other hand, each of these attributes identifies a different aspect of God's existence and character that cannot be reduced to the others. This, la uh, this latter point is especially important given the tendency of recent critics critiques to identify this doctrine with the extreme view that denies the real difference between the attributes. One implication is that we cannot rank God's attributes or make one essential to God than the other. Then we have a skewed view of God. God is love even when He judges. He is holy and righteous even in saving sinners. He is eternal even when He acts in time. So we cannot uh, value one attribute over the other. We may recall this distinction between God's essence and God's energies. The sun is the substance with many various rays. In Basil's expression, the energies are various and the essence is simple. But we say that we know God, our God, from His energies, but we do not undertake to approach near to His essence. His energies come down to us, but His essence remains beyond our reach. Does that, that, does that make sense? Like the sun, we feel the sun rays radiating and we uh, we see sunlight, vitamin D, nutrients given to us. But if we're too close and we touch the sun, we'll be consumed by it, right? Uh, so uh, we, we don't even touch the sun, but we're still feeling its energies, effects. So in the same way, it's, it's like that. God is like the sun in that uh, His essence, we cannot touch, we cannot see, we don't know. Uh, no one has touched the sun and survived. But we know of its energies and effects and benefits. Uh, so humanity exists and there are particular attributes of this nature that I as an individual may not may or may not possess. However, God is different. There is no genus of deity where of which God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a species. Although we cannot help but talk about this immutability, then his goodness. That his love, we should not imagine that God is composed of these various attributes. Rather, God's existence is identical with his attributes for all the divine attributes, whether named or conceived, are of like rank, one with another. Notes Gregory of Nyssa, God's goodness, love, omniscience, and holiness are simply who God is. I would still be human if I lacked judgment or enterprise, but God would not be God if we did not possess, if we did not possess all of the, his attributes in the simplicity and perfection of his essence. Thus, whatever God gives is given out of the abundance rather than the lack. It is God that first lives and then also loves. Notes bar. But God loves and this is, uh, and in this act lives. This is true of all God's, all of God's attributes. Simplicity reminds us that God is never self-conflicted. In God's eternal decree, even in the most obvious example of possible inner conflict, namely the cross, justice and mercy, righteous wrath, and gracious love embrace, there are uh, we there are we who expect to see the greatest inner conflict within God. We read that in Christ God's reconciling the world to himself at the place where the outpouring of his wrath is concentrated. So too is his love. Neither overwhelms or cancels out the other. God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Romans 3, 26, emphasis added. At the same time, simplicity does not, just like the reform view, eliminate the difference between attributes. Love, justice, goodness, and other attributes are mere, are not mere symptoms, but are conceptually different in God himself. We do not worship any divine attribute. We worship the personal God who is simultaneously the being that his attributes indicate God is love, but is not God. Love is not God. Nor does the doctrine of simplicity allow us to speak of God, limiting himself. As Arminian theology has held, and very form, various forms of Hegelian kenosis have emphasized, nor God is sovereign without also being, at the same time, God, good, just, and loving. God is never free. Not to be God, none of his attributes can be suspended, withdrawn, diminished, altered. Even his attributes are identical with his existence. The denial of this attribute is often motivated by a border, broader criticism of God's immutability, impassibility, and eternity, as we will see. It's not surprising that some critics of simplicity go on to deny God's spirituality. There is but a short 
a step from the denial of at least his minimal affirmation of simplicity to the denial of God's infinity, his divine transcendence. We're going to now talk about his God's self-existence, how God exists by himself. Before we speak of God relating freely to creatures and entering into human history as Lord and Redeemer, Karl Barth properly stressed the point that the God who is God without us has nevertheless determined to be God with us. Freedom from God creation is the ground of God's freedom for creation. Classical Christian theology has affirmed that God is, um, uh, which means basically independent of all eternal dependence. A similar term is absolute, literally without uh, relation. This does not mean that God is incapable of relationship. It simply affirms that God relates the creatures to himself, but is not related to the world. Clearly, the relation between God and his creation qualitatively different from any other. We naturally depend on others. Friendship exposes us to the joys and disappointments in life. Each day goes well poorly in large measure because of what other people say, will do, or feel in relation to us. The psalmist exalts, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. We are told in Isaiah 40. This question, to whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, is repeated in verse 25, by the, again, in verse 40, uh, in, in chapter 46, 5, contrasting God's sovereignty, eternity, and unfathomable understanding with human weakness. No one can thwart God's ultimate designs. Life is predicated properly of God. Only analogically can we say that God lives and we live in other words, there is no such thing as life that can be predicated of God and humans univocally in this essence. God is, is life and He gives us life. God transcends, transcends heaven itself, which He has created. As Paul explained to the Athenian philosophers, this is one of the attributes that highlight the contrast between God and the idol. The God who made us, the world and everything in it, being of Lord uh, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he has needed anything. He never needs anything from us, and yet he still uh, wants to be have, have this kind of relationship with us. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breathed out everything, or who has given life to him, give to him, that he might be repaid. For from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be glory forever and ever. Right? For by him and, and for him are all things are made. In Philippians, we know, we know that too. For God's independence from the world is a necessary core relate of his glory. As is probably true, as many biblical scholars and theologians in recent decades have been eager to point out that a primary text for God's aseity, Exodus 3.14, does not bear the weight that is placed on it. I am who I am from the birth to be. May also be translated, I will be who I will be. However, the sermon that Yahweh preaches to Moses when he causes his glory to pass by suggests the connection to God's freedom. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. It is God's sovereignty, God's choice, God's election. If this is at least significant and part of what is intended in Exodus 3.14, God's independence from creation or at least implied. So we know that God, ego imi hoon, I am the being, to denote an alterable being as a chief characteristic of the deity. Jesus' statement in John 8, 58, before Abraham I was, ego imi, adds credibility to this interpretation. Furthermore, further support is found in Revelation uh, 1, 8 and 17, 18. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the Lord God uh, who is I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. I am the Almighty. I am the first and the last and the living one. So we, if we interpret the Old Testament promise in line with the new fulfillment, this statement is probably the best interpretation of Exodus 3.14. <clears throat> Therefore, while Exodus 3.14 may not say everything that the tradition has supposed, it says a good deal more than many of the critics of Assyri allow. Independent of conditions of finitude, uh, appropriate to creaturely existence, Yahweh can be trusted to bring, past, bring to pass everything that He has promised. 
His name can be invoked with total confidence, both because he is faithful uh, to his promise and because he is not dependent on creatures for realizing his purposes. Egypt's pantheon is the foil in contrast uh, to the various nature gods limited by specific areas of provenance. Uh, Yahweh is a sovereign God precisely because God is not dependent on anyone or anything he has created. We are, we are assured that nothing will keep him from God being there for us. So God is not limited to uh, a specific region or provenance just like the Egyptian pantheon was. So sun God, uh, the river God uh, is not limited to the things that are created. God is no more dependent on human beings in salvation than in creation. Nothing but God's free decision is responsible for creaturely existence. Worthy are you, Lord, our Lord God, to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things by your will, and they existed and were created. Uh, one of Jesus' unmistakable references to his deity was that he, like the Father, has life in himself. The cosmos, cosmos the earth, uh, and we ourselves exist for God. God does not exist for us. And even our existence is not necessary for, God, necessary for God's existence or happiness. Yahweh is the God who stands by His word, the, the one who will be faithful to His people. This is why the proclamation of the name is so closely associated with the proclamation of God's mercy and grace. Moses responds to such proclamation with the recognition that he represents a stiff-necked people, and that is only because God is merciful and will pardon all our iniquities and our sin and take us for your inheritance. That in His presence, uh, that His presence can be regarded as a blessing rather than a curse. That it is not claiming too much, therefore, to suggest that the gospel itself is embedded in the very name of Israel's God. The fact that God is incomparable and transcends the world who inhabits uh, whose inhabitants are to him like grasshoppers and whose rulers of the earth um, he makes as emptiness, brings delight to the weak, he gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Evil powers have never had, they never had the last word because God also, although God enters into the matrix of creaturely power, he's never simply one player among Others, God remains qualitatively and not quanti quantitatively distinct from creation and is good news for those who the future seems destined to be controlled by oppressors because God is in control. In Paul's Mars Hill speech, Paul points out that in God we live and move and have our being rather than vice versa. Uh, there is relatedness but it is that of the world God to God than rather than to God to the world. Even in the Incarnation, Eternal Son assumed our humanity rather than vice versa. It is precisely in God's in independence and freedom from con contingency that a habitable space is open for the freedom of contingent, contingent reality. If the world is not God's body, it is nevertheless God's house, yet it is a place for us to have fellowship with Him rather than a temple that He needs or can contain Him. <coughs> Consequently, the extravagant variety in creation is an expression of God's lavish generosity. For example, think of the variety of colors in creation. And not, not only of colors, but of shades. God could just as easily have created a simpler, more spartan, and more economical world, but He preferred to create a theater of abundance, beauty, and difference, sheer extravagance and liberality, there is no room in this view for fatalism. Our world is a result of God's freedom and not God's necessity. And we're going to try to uh, wrap up that and go to God's immutability. Another negation of finitude is immutability or non-changeability. God does not change. There is no shadow of changing with the building on the patristic consensus. Thomas Aquinas argued that God is actus persus or actus perus pure act, which means that there are no potential, uh, potential, uh, let, me let me try to pronounce this, potentialities with God, compare, complete and perfect in, in himself from eternity to eternity. God has no potential that is not already fully realized. God cannot be more infinite, loving, or holy 
tomorrow than today. If God alone is necessary in and independent of all external condition, fully conditions, fully relies on all of His perfections, then there is literally nothing for God to become. For us, change might be better for, or for worse, but for a perfect God, change can only yield imperfection. The perfection of God's gift depends on His own perfection. As James reminds us, everything good, everything good and perfect comes from above, coming down to the Father of lights, uh, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So, that means, for better or for worse, richer or poor, we make this vow to our spouses, right, in our marriage, covenant, for God, change can only yield imperfection. God, everything good and perfect is from God. Just as the affirmation of God's independence comes from creation in no way excludes God's freedom to enter into relation with creatures, Scripture clearly teaches that God changes creaturely reality, but not himself changed. So this was the same with God. Uh, when Jesus came, he touched the sinners. He was not changed by sinners. Uh, when uh, Jews did not want to touch the lepers, right, because the uh, disease would affect them, God, the religious leaders walked away from dirty things because they thought they would be virtually impure. God healed, God touched them, but He did not, He was not changed. The immutability of God was present with Jesus Christ as well. Uh, the psalmist praises, they will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment, you will change them like a robe, and they will pass away, but you are the same, and your years have no end. God's immutability is hardly irrelevant speculation, given the sinfulness of His human partner. It is a grand assurance, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, children, uh, children of Jacob, are not consumed. Malachi 3.6 In Scripture, are the virtues of God in God's changelessness lies in the assurance that God is reliable in His promises. Not only because he wills to be faithful to his word, but because he cannot change his eternal counsels regarding, regardless of what creatures do, as the omniscient all-knowing God, who knows the end of the beginning, including the days he calls, he has allotted for us, and even the secrets of the heart. There is no contingency that God's eternal decree has not taken into consideration. God knew that Adam would sin, plunging humanity into corruption, and he knew that Israel will fall as well. Nothing catches God by surprise, so that he would have to alter his revealed character or the predetermined course that is secret to us. Similarly, in Hebrews, God assures believers for all the immutability of his promise by referring to two unchangeable things, God, God's being, and his oath to Abraham. Not only God's essence, but his ultimate purpose and secret decrees do not change. Indeed, God works all things together for the good of His people. Believers were predestined according to the purpose of Him, who works all things according to the counsel of His will. In all of these passages, God's unchangeable decree is presented as the basis for the believer's comfort, that even if we are faithless, He may he remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. Above the basis, uh, uh, vicissitudes of fluctuating circumstances, ever-changing response of God's covenant partners. There is the unchanging purpose of God, and in this, God's people can take the immeasurable assurance, even though the covenant of creation has been broken, and even Israel lies together in spiritual death with the world in Adam as transgressors. The eternal covenant of redemption remains uh, inviolable because it is not conditioned on the human side, but, it's the, but on the immutable will of the triune God. Yet how do we square this uh, with a host of passages that seem to suggest that God does not adapt to new circumstances, at least in terms of changing His mind? Exodus 32, 10, 14 portrays God as relenting from destroying the Israelites because of Moses' intercession. In Jonah 3, 10 we read, when God saw that uh, what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster uh, He had he said that he would do to them, and he did not do it. We will address these important messages after considering historical development of this doctrine. So, historical definition uh, tells us God does not change. Uh, again, the sun and its rays, analogy frequently drawn. God is not changed. God does not change. 
um, in, in, in some modern challenges to God's immutability. Um, I want to touch. I want to touch briefly on God's impassibility. God's impassibility. Impassibility means immunity to suffering. Is God affected by us? Our answer to this question is already determined by a large extent on our view of God's simplicity, aseity, and immutability. Once we deny God's independence from the world, aseity, it's difficult to avoid a side, a slide toward God creating, uh, or toward creating God in our own image. If God is dependent on the world, then it follows that in principle, at least, God can become overwhelmed and overcome by the world's opposition. All of the talk, uh, <clears throat> all of the talk among open theists of God's infinite resourcefulness cannot eliminate the possibility that God's saving purposes will finally be thwarted on a grand scale, even as they ostensibly, in the case uh, of those who do not share in the glory of God's new creation, and the way we define impassibility first, it is important to define what we mean by impassibility. It's important, the Greek word apathia, because it is used in Stoicism and in Christian theology, may be misunderstood as referring to the same idea as impossibility. However, the apathy or the indifference at which the Stoic philosopher aimed immunity to the harm of the delight that makes one's happiness depend on others is far from the Christian conception. This difference meaning uh, uh, is, is further obscured by the fact that the Latin cognate passes is typically understood in the English word form passion to refer to emotions generally. So however, in this uh, historical theological context, impassibility is more specific. As Gerald Bray points out, the Greek theologian John of Damascus clearly defined God's apathia as suffering, as in the passion of Christ. Uh, the emphasis was not on tranquility in a state of indifference, but on the sovereignty of God. Evaluating the doctrine of impassibility. Deducing the attributes of the gods from their self-sufficiency, Plato taught that the gods cannot even love. Similarly, in our own day, John Milbank argues the divine impassibility means that, strict speaking, strictly speaking, God is not offended by our sin and therefore does not require satisfaction of his justice. This eliminates even the possibility of forgiveness as well as wrath. Obviously, this view would find no foothold in biblical revelation. So the problem inherited by Christian theologians such as Augustine was how to hold simultaneously to God's independence from the world and the central affirmation of God's love. Kevin Van Hooser explains Augustine's solution to the paradox of God's love is to posit properly divine kind of love, a gift love, agape. In other words, God loves out of sheer abundance and self-sufficiency, not in order to receive anything in return. Following the Platonic rather than Stoic tradition, Gustin had no fear of eros, desire out of need, tainting love. It was perfectly natural and appropriate for human beings to change, exchange the gifts of self-interest and regard for another. In any case, Augustine did not think it impossible, think it possible to eliminate self-interest from love in a pure kind of stoic indifference that Kant and modern ethics imagine. Augustine argues that things different when it comes to God, since all things exist from him, through him, for him, he stands in need of nothing. Plato's mistake was to think that God who needs nothing cannot love. In the view of the author, the mistake of contemporary critics of divine impassibility is to think that God who loves must be needy. Before he criticized Augustine too quickly, as mirrored in Greek rather than biblical presuppositions, we should recall again Paul's speech, the God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temple made by man, nor he is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything from us. Since he himself gives to all mankind and breath and everything, in Romans Paul cites Job 35, 7, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory and uh, glory forever. Amen. It is appropriate for humans who are by nature needy to offer gifts to each other for self-fulfillment and for our regard for the other. 
However, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, whom there is no variation or shadow of change. Although Augustine's interpretation of God's agape love reflects in some Christian alternative to Platonism and Stoicism, he could, see, he could not see how God's bliss could be in any way affected by his creatures. Of course, in his commentaries, Augustine could affirm that God judged, had compassion, was roused to anger, and so forth. But such expressions are not only affirmed and logically, they are frequently explained away as un unbefitting for a self-complete God. In my view, this tendency rests largely on the lack of distinction between God's essence and energies. Yet with these important distinctions, we are able to say, while God's energies may sometimes be affected creaturely action, God's essence and decree do not change. So um, this impassibility has its um, roots in Augustine and also critique by modern philosophers. God's eternity and omnipresence, these are incommunicable, incommunicable attributes. They are not shared by God and us. Right? God's eternity and omnipresence. God is present everywhere. Since eternity and omnipresence refer to God's transcendence of time and space, respectively, it is worthwhile to treat them together. Various definitions of eternity have been articulated in the history of thought, with Plato holding that the one transcends time. And Aristotle argued, arguing that God is within time, but without beginning or end. The 5th century Christian thinker, um, Bothius, supplied perhaps the most favored definition of eternity among theologians for centuries. The whole simultaneous and perfect possession of boundless life, Augustine revised the Platonic concept of eternity away from simple negation of time to what a more eschatological view of eternity as fullness of time. In other words, eternity is God's a gathering up of all of our times, healing and redeeming them from the sorrows of this present age. Advocates of uh, sempiternity uh, affirm that God had no beginning at all and will have no end. But they will see this divine existence as duration to all times rather than existence from above or beyond time. Therefore, they suggest God is not eternal but everlasting. If we knew exactly what eternity is, we would be eternal. In other words, God, therefore, is critical here to remain within the bonds of Scripture. Explicit, explicit statements and legitimate inferences from those statements. God is praised because from everlasting to everlasting you are God. Celebrated because He is enthroned forever in His Sabbath rest glory. Such passages, however, indecisive for the present question since at least Evangelical critics of God's eternity do not deny God's everlastingness, sempiternity. As Burkhoff uh, observes, uh, indecisive, as Burkhoff, excuse me, as Burkhoff observes, the form of uh, the form in which the Bible represents God's eternity is simply that of duration through endless ages. Psalm 90, 102, Ephesians 3. We should remember, however, that in speaking, as it does, the Bible uses popular language and not the language of philosophy. Favoring sympathetity, everlastingness, Robert Raymond thinks Burkhoff's last sentence is too, is too easily invokes, invokes the uh, mystery instead of squarely facing the problems he thinks that are inherent in the classic, classical Augustinian view of God as timelessly eternal. However, I mean, uh, the author is inclined to interpret Burkhoff as properly respecting the limitations inherent in our capacity to determine the nature of eternity by extrapolating from our experience of time. So at this point, our view of eternity may be illuminated by God's omnipresence in declaring the temple, solemn and praise, behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How, can, how much is less in this house that I have built? Uh, so Proverbs, uh, uh, provoked by Israel's domestication of his transcendent. God declares, I am a God at hand, declares the Lord, I am not a God far and, and not a God far away. Can a man hide himself in secret places so I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heaven and the earth, declares the Lord, omnipresence of God? Not even hell can be described as separation from God, rather it is God's presence in wrath. 
The psalmist exclaimed, exclaimed where, could, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where else shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. There is no day or night to God, no passage of days. Paradoxically, it is God's transcendence of time and place that brings the psalmist in deepest assurance of God's imminence of all times and places. God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. Why God is omnipresent in essential attribute? God's dwelling in the midst of his people is a prominent motif from Genesis to Revelation, creation to consummation. God's concrete presence among his people whom he liberated in the Exodus in, indicated by the pillar of cloud was reckoned essential for proof of Israel's election. On the way to Canaan, God dwells with his people outside the camp, in the tabernacle, through the priesthood and sacrifices, given his holiness and Israel's sin, there must be a safe distance. Yet his goal is to dwell in the midst of his people, on Mount Zion in the temple. Then in the ministry of Christ, the promise is given that he is God's temple, filled uh, with the whole, with glory, with the glorious spirit, forgiving sins, ascends to heaven, ascending to heaven, prepare a place for us, and sending his spirit to us to make living stones of us, spirit-filled temple sanctuary. In Revelation, God finally is seated in the midst of his elect, in the vision of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, John hears the voice declare, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and he will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. The question of God's presence and absence in the unconventional drama is equivalent to the question of salvation and judgment. In other words, we meet in Scripture both ontological omnipresence and covenantal judicial presence in God. So this is the incommunicable attributes of God and we see the communicable attributes of God and these are uh, sovereignty uh, um, it talks about I think goodness love and mercy holiness righteousness and justice jealousy and wrath we we can have jealousy we can have wrath we can have love joy uh, we can have holiness righteousness and justice um, uh, goodness, love, and mercy. These are all communicable attributes. God who lives as Trinity. We believe in the triune God. Um, some other views of the Trinity are modalism and subordination. Um, there is orthodox Trinitarianism, what we believe God is one essence and three persons. Um, the uh, the fathers, church fathers, outlined this Hippolytus, Tertullian, Athanasius, Gustin, the Cappadocian fathers, and Council of Nicaea, that's where we get the Nicene Creed. Tritheism, God is three persons with no unity of essence. Um, this is a uh, false view, there's not a correct view. And we know we have these fathers, Cappadocian fathers, to thank because they. Um, Develop the theology of the Trinity. Trinity, modern Trinity, is a uh, central doctrine of Christianity in the Nicene Creed as well, and that is where we get to God who creates. God who creates. Um, I'm going to try to finish this section. Um, hopefully, this um, before today. God who rescues, reigns in grace, glory. Uh, God creates us uh, out of his trinity he creates us ex nihilo he creates us uh, out of nothing God's decree is mentioned traditional reform interpretation of God's decree uh, God creates time uh, God creates ex nihilo out of nothing he creates us um, a brief mention about Trinity and creation. That's why doctrine of Trinity and creation is essential. The Greek versions of pagan cosmology continue to cast spell over some clearly uh, early theologians. This is particularly true of uh, the cat uh, of, of the school in Alexandria led by Origen, like the Jewish philosopher Philio of Alexandria. Century before, Origen tried to accommodate uh, the Bible to Platonism, 
Origen held that creation is eternal in part because of this assumption that if God became a creator, then he could not be immutable. His cosmology was therefore far from historical and linear. It was cyclical, uh, with each soul being reincarnated until all spirits, including Satan and his angelic conspirators, uh, co-conspirators became purged of their attachment to matter uh, through moral and spiritual education. Furthermore, although Origen's view of the world as eternal com uh, comports better with modern science before Einstein, uh, the current scientific consensus has been rushing in the reverse direction of the last half, and emphasizing a temporal beginning as well as evidence signs of contingency. We saw in chapter 1 that the biblical world we contrast sharply with the monism dualisms of pagan ontologies, the biblical doctrine of creation is in heart of the contrast. First, the creator is personal and is truly three persons, that is one in essence, persons in essence. There is no ground for a primordial dualism between one and many. Second, biblical doctrine of creation distinguishes reality into creator and creation, rather than spirit and matter. Angels and human souls are not eternal. They are as truly a part of God's creation as elephants and human bodies. Therefore, the material creation cannot be conceived in terms of a falling away from the divine being to corrupt becoming in the spiritual as well as the physical aspects. Human beings have no history prior to the world's creation. It is the original condition that God pronounced a good. Third, this goodness of God's original difference is further underscored by the plurality within creation itself, nor only in the diversity of living and inanimate nature generally, but given, but even in the difference between humanity as male and female. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, the Trinity is a central part of that as well. Integrity of creation, beyond God and the gaps, Genesis scientific apologetics, God of the gaps, design contingency, so forth, so forth, so far and so forth. Um, those uh, are, are, are outlined in this section as well. Um, Providence, God's care for all that he has made. Human, what is human? Status of human. Is it just we are a lucky animal or uh, we are distinct? Is it uh, trichotomy, dichotomy, or monism, just physical organisms? Trichotomy is uh, human beings that compose the spirit, mind, soul in descending rank. Dichotomy is human beings are just of soul and, and body. Or monism is just one self servant. What is the image of God? The origins of eschatology. Um, and again, image of God is is in this section as well. God who creates. Uh, God's angels also in this as well and we go to the fall of man God who creates he created and the fall of man uh, is eventually is listed here as well uh, as we have encountered but the Holy Spirit is the divine witness who surveys creation and pronounces benediction it is the same spirit who walked in the garden in judgment flushing Adam and Eve out of the bushes and will let the Israelites in pillar and cloud witnessing to the world Israel belong to Yahweh as the liberator, taking us under his wing, as it were the same spirit makes us witnesses. But there is also a false witness, the one who will be identified in relation to the persecution of God's people, the one who accuses them day and night before our God. He is a liar and a father of lies, once the chief magistrate under God in heaven, has become the archetype and ruler of false witnesses on earth. It is seen clearly in the familiar story in the fall of Genesis, fall in Genesis against the Creator's clear instruction, which put the entire garden at the disposal of humanity except for the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The serpent first misinterprets God's stipulation. Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? When this fails, he asserts, he asserts directly that Eve and Adam will not die, but in fact will be like God, autonomous and self-sufficient to determine good and evil for themselves. It is deceptive speech. In his deceptive speech, 
Lucifer makes himself sound like he's more interested in their welfare than God. But his ultimate aim is to make them his image bearers rather than God's. This decisive point, notes Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is that this question suggests to man that he should go behind the word of God and establish what is by himself out of his understanding of the being of God. Beyond this given word of God, the serpent pretends somehow to know, somehow to know something about the profundity of the true God who is so badly mis misrepresented in this human world. The serpent claims that a path to the knowledge of the real God behind the world is not atheism that is introduced by the serpent, but, but idolatrous religion, says Bonhoeffer. The wolf in sheep's clothing, Satan in angels, form of life. This is a shape appropriate to evil. This will, the, this will be the doubt that Satan will introduce through false religion through the ages. Did God say? It plainly is the godless question. Did God say? That he is love, that he wishes to forgive our sins, that we need only believe him, that we need no works, that Christ has died and has been raised for us, that we shall live, have eternal life in his kingdom, that we are no longer alone but upheld by God's grace, that one day all sorrow and wailing will have an end. Did God say, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness? Did he really say it to me? Perhaps it does not apply to my particular case. Did God say that He is a God who, wrath, who is wrathful towards those who do not keep His commandments? Did He demand the sacrifices of Christ? I know better that He is the in, infinitely good, the all-loving Father. This is a question that appears innocuous, but though Eve, innocuous, but through it, evil wins power in us. Through it, we become disobedient to God. Man is expected to be judged with God's word instead of simply hearing, obeying, and doing it. Imitating the Father who likes the creature brought into being as God's star witness begins to interpret reality within himself rather than God at the center. With man proceeds against the concrete word of God, with the weapons of a principle, with an idea of God. He is at the right from the first. If he, if he becomes God's master, he has left the path of obedience. He has withdrawn. God addressing him. So this, I want to probably end here, actually. I want to end here because, because let me explain. This is so key. That we interpret God's word as if God is speaking to us. We simply need to hear what God speaks to us and through His Spirit gives us, um, touches us and, and motivates us inspired us and we need to hear the plain voice of God because the sheep knows the voice of the shepherd we cannot say like have this false witness you are Satan says God did God really say did God really say this yes God said if you eat of the fruit you will die God said if you sin you will die the wages of sin is death. You will die. But the gift of God is eternal life. We need to interpret Scripture as if God intended for us. So I believe that there is one intended meaning of Scripture, what God wants us to understand. God's meaning. God's interpretation. There is one reading of Scripture. There is no multiple meaning, readings. There is no reading, I feel like this Scripture is this way today. I feel like scripture is saying this to me today. It's not that. There is one reading of scripture. Reformed Protestant believers believe that there is one reading of scripture, God, what God intended us for us to understand. In order for us to get that reading, uh, it, it basically anchors us to the truth. And that is what I'm trying to get. Systemic, systematic theology is so important because it gives us this tool, this worldview, this uh, at least a basic philosophical framework that we can un understand and interpret scriptures. I believe that we're coming to a, a day and age where there's so much deception, there's so much misunderstanding, there's so much other messages that are coming at us. And we know that this question of this, uh, this, this seemingly innocent question of, did God really say that? Does it really say that in the Bible? 
we're making God false witness. We're just listening and obeying what Satan thinks, right? So it is our desire, it is my desire for us to be completely consumed by God's love, completely consumed by God's infinite desire to be with us in, in, in through the sacrifice of His Son, through the working of the Holy Spirit, that we know what, what, we, what God is telling us through the Scriptures. We went over all the books of the Bible. We went over all the books of the Old Testament. We went over all the books of the New Testament, knowing what God has written to us is true. Trusting that what He has given us is true, is real, is right. Did God say, did God say this? Did God say truly, truly, truly that you will not die? No one is righteous. Not one understands God. No one seeks God. Seeks God. Paul adds to this. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. Their venom of asp is under their lips. What does that remind you of? That reminds you of the serpent, the Satan, right? We have all become children of the serpent, the Satan. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive, right? What, why, why is there two tongues? Why is there two tongues in a serpent? One says truth, one says lie. If you say truth and lies, oh, I'm saying at least a little bit of truth. I'm saying a little bit of truth here, but lies, I, I do lie, I say lies too. That means you have two tongues. You are a son of the serpent. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. What does that remind you of? Snake, serpent. Their mouth is full of curses, bitterness. Their feet are so swift to shed blood. Their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Romans 3, 10, 18. Though the law that was once given as the way to eternal life. Now, there is now, because of sin, only expectation of death and judgment. The law announces this to everyone who is under it, written for God. So this is, this is a false witness. I want to end here. The fall came through one man and salvation came through one man. Through one man's disobedience, sin came, death came. Through one man's obedience, salvation came. That is through Jesus Christ. And hopefully, with this uh, understanding, I, we, I wasn't able to finish today. But hopefully, we can get to a point where we understand interpreting God's word according to God's interpretation, God's eye is so important. That is where we want to go. That is where we want uh, to live. Because God's interpretation is what uh, makes a God's word God's word, right? God's way to hear God's, in, God, God's interpretation, not man's interpretation, not Satan's interpretation, not anybody else's, but God. God is spirit. God inspired. This is an inspired scripture in our scripture. Uh, that's what I have for today. Uh, next week, we're going to try to wrap up everything and, and, and have more of a practical application to our biblical interpretation. Uh, God is, is continually pouring out His love, pouring out His grace, just like the sun and His rays. The sun uh, does shine its rays to us, and yet we, if we don't have the ability to hear that, get that, we will not see that. So uh, it is our job uh, as, as students of God's Word to, to understand it. Uh, uh, we need this fresh fresh understanding of him. Uh, yeah, I hope that this has been helpful to you today. Uh, this is what I have for you uh, this week. And um, I hopefully can wrap uh, our, our biblical interpretation up next week when we uh, conclude this course. So this is what I have for you today.